Node. This is the Spine Technology Education, and the D stands for Discovery, Debate, uh, uh, Discourse, and General uh, Parts of Spine. Uh, they are varying topics. Uh, today, we're very lucky to have our partner, Dr. Bob Hart, here, and he's one of the leading members of the ISSG, the uh, Spinal Deformity uh, Group that has made such a difference and impact on all of our lives, and he's had a very successful uh, lecture series on rod fractures. And uh, for those of you who've tuned in um, uh, for Dr. Theodore, he had an urgent case, so he sends apologies. He'll be rescheduled before the end of the year. So uh, positively, but he sends his apologies, but it was unavoidable. But Dr. Hart is a outstanding um, colleague and uh, more than adequate substitute uh, for uh, these topics that are focusing on select uh, issues that pertain to all of our lives. So, as you all know, we are going to start some case discussions. Dr. Hart is here in the audience with us, and we'll go through some cases, and we'll uh, elaborate on uh, fusions and the indications uh, for fusions and uh, the role of hardware to facilitate this. So we have four cases selected. Is it five cases, Bob? Did you select an extra case? Yeah, um, but we'll start with Dr. Seidel. The uh, fellows will introduce themselves and they've prepared some cases and we'll bat around and I'll follow online for any chat uh, uh, activity. So, Chris. All right, my name is Chris Seidel. I'm gonna be presenting a case to you. I'm gonna jump right in here. So this is a 44-year-old female who is notably a Jehovah's Witness. She had several weeks of increasing weakness and numbness in the abdomen and lower extremities from about the T6 level down. This resulted in several falls. Uh, past medical history, some hypertension, obesity, history of spinal stenosis, most notably though, she had a C2 to C5 decompression and instrumentation back in March of 2020 for uh, OPLL um, that's gonna come into play here. When she presented to us, she was about a NERC 5 at that point, um, definitely weaker in her lower extremities with that T6 down uh, kind of numbness. In progress. So let's see if I can make this work. You can see in that T5 to T8 level, uh, she has that notable OPLL, that segmental OPLL segment, and some severe canal compromise. Chris, as you're playing through those videos, can you just uh, refresh everybody's uh, mind as to what OPLL is, what its etiopathologies. And can you run through the video on the sagittal also? Sure. Yeah, so OPLL uh, is ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. Um, it's typically more prevalent in Asian descent, um, but there is about a 1% to 2% uh, prevalence in North America. It's about 5% in Asian countries. Uh, you can have continuous segmental or some sort of a hybrid, um, and the hybrid is typically the one that you see has the most progression to it. So there's a genetic component to it? Is there a nutritional there's, component to it or a uh, mass component? There is a nutritional component to it. I can't remember exactly what it is. I want to say it has something to do with a high salt diet, but I'm not 100% sure about that. So we have a lecture series, uh, and you just got yourself a new lecture Friday morning. We have this so-called message to Garcia sure. uh, uh, vignettes, five minutes or less. Uh, tell us about OPLL uh, pathology and etiol etiopathology. You got it's it. It's a genetically modulated inflammation of the, um, uh, I guess it's fibroblasts and the uh, posterior longitudinal ligament. It's actually very specific, and the gene locus has been identified now. Uh, it's actually it's two or three um, uh, variants, mutants, that can kind of lead to this weird inflammatory pathology. Mm -hmm. And that's a major thing. Do you have any images of the neck or probably not in this presentation? I, I don't. I just kept it to the thoracic spine. So, so this lady is very myelopathic. Yeah, why don't you run through those? As you're running through those, uh, Bob, so uh, I did her surgery for her neck. Um, C2 to C5, we don't have any images for that, but she actually did quite well with that. Can you 
share your thoughts in terms of the role of a fusion with a patient. I did a simple posterior multi-level decompression and fusion, not worrying about these anterior osteophytes, low dosing as well as possible. She actually did very well from that. But how far do we fuse? Um, do we kind of go above and below the anterior pathology? Or what are your thoughts? Let's start there. Yeah, this, this is uh, OPLL is one of the classic uh, pathologies uh, and oftentimes seen on call uh, because patients do uh, develop these symptoms that are severe and uh, need urgent attention. Um, you know, I think there's, there's a number of things we've learned over the years from this. Uh, one thing is don't go anteriorly uh, if you can avoid it uh, because you're going to be through dura and i know of at least two cases that i heard of that uh, had severe spinal cord injuries as a result of an anterior approach uh, but, uh, because of the, uh, the you, you just don't have a plane and so you're mm -hmm. into the cord before you know it um, so posterior approaches are definitely preferred um, uh, i think We've learned also that if we don't fuse the patients, that you can see progression of the OPLL. And I've learned that in one case of my own that I recall there was a thoracic lesion that we did just a laminectomy uh, on a weekend for a, a woman. And ab about six or eight years later, I want to say I saw her back with a progression of her uh, stenosis and a progression of her paralysis. So um, that's that it's important, I think, to do a fusion. I, I will say in my own, to my own knowledge, I'm not sure we know that a fusion halts the progression. Uh, so that's to be determined, but we do know that without a fusion, it can progress. And so certainly in thoracic spine, where a fusion is not uh, typically a, uh, first of all, not difficult to obtain, and secondly, uh, not typically uh, that limiting to the patient, uh, I would definitely include a fusion. And, you know, I think I still might do some laminoplasties in the cervical spine in some cases, uh, but uh, definitely a posterior approach. So that's a great uh, brief overview. Uh, tell us about, so Dr. Skuyan just joined us. So mid-thoracic spine decompressions, uh, Dr. Skuyan, uh, can you go back one? So sure. this is an OPLL patient. She's a fairly large lesion. Now you're a neurosurgeon and in traditional neurosurgery, um, there was kind of a strong thought that uh, you don't have to do a fusion from, uh, for the thoracic spine decompression. Is that still relevant? So uh, I've actually, I've kind of gone uh, full circle. I remember as a resident, um, we would do Lammies on this. And um, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, um, I would do a fusion and I would go wide and long, you know, um, and I, th I think you, you know this as well, Jens. I think the most important thing for me here is the cord. And so, um, you know, going back to what Charlie Schoon's theory is, I think, you know, the cord, if you just do a small lamy, it'll herniate out. Um, and so I think that's why you have to do a very wide laminectomy, multi-level, and do a fusion. Otherwise, this thing, you're going to have a high rate of not only neurologic deficit, but uh, potential failure down the road. So I want to thank our followers and uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Skouras, Panagiotis Skouras, uh, thank you for watching us in Greece. Um, appreciate your kind words. Um, and Dr. Medisa Madeira, uh, same. Uh, Dr. Patare, uh, he identified very correctly that there are two components to OPLL, so we'll hear about that on Friday, but uh, he's quite right. There's a genetic component and there's a biomechanical component. So the size of the patient and the location matters. So this is no coincidence that this patient had this in the, her mid-thoracic spine where there's a hyperkyphosis present also now. Uh, Dr. Henin, uh, I mean, thanks for joining us here. A great uh, long-term follower. Anterior posterior fusion, I think Dr. Uh, Hart already identified uh, his thoughts, posterior fusion. You want to stay away from anterior because of dural erosion and it's, uh, it's a very frustrating procedure that compromises or can compromise the anterior spinal artery. So here we have a very large patient. Chris, have you treated uh, in your residency OPLL patients? I have not. Yeah. So this is something that's uh, definitely an issue. Um, now, Bob, back to you. I stopped. We sadly don't have a geography picture of her overall fusion extent. I fused to C2 to C5. Uh, Chris, go into midline section uh, and maybe on the CT and 
uh, tell us what the upper level of the main pathology is. So do I have to fuse her and connect her to C5, or is it okay to leave some levels that are not as badly affected intact? So the old fusion was C2 to C5, and now we have a substantial mid-thoracic lesion. Stop there. And Chris, can you use your cursor and show us what the upper level is? Yeah, so T5 is here, and T8 is here. So T5 to T8, and again, totally spot on, uh, Dr. Patari, uh, uh, biomechanics do matter. So this is a high tension area that induces this inflammatory misresponse of the body. So how high do I go now, Bob? Do I have to go to C5? And remember, this patient is a fairly um, anti-transfusion or totally anti-transfusion patient. So she's very large. What's her BMI, Chris? 45, I believe. 48.5. So very large woman, absolutely against that. And here we have a compromised cord, general, general, so a truly genuine incomplete cord injury. So how high do we go? Do we have to connect to the previous hardware or not? You know, I, I, we don't have really all of the imaging, but I think based on what I've seen, I would be inclined not to do that and just focus on this symptomatic piece. There's obviously some possibility that she progresses in the intervening segments. Uh, but again, I'm not sure that a fusion prevents that from occurring. So I would focus on what's causing her problems now, I think, and particularly in a patient that's large and a Jehovah's Witness like she is. Yeah. So I think there's general agreement. I don't see any um, uh, uh, disagreement there. This is a generally ossifying lesion. So Chris, tell us what we did. Yeah, so the general thoughts that we've kind of mentioned already that need to be going through your head are how do you prepare for a Jehovah's Witness patient, uh, potentially bloody surgery, and she obviously does not want any transfusion. Um, like we already mentioned, do you just go posterior or is there a role for trying to get this from the anterior side as well because of that critical kyphotic angle in the thoracic spine is measured at 23 degrees, this patient is 35. And again, because of the type of surgery that you're anticipating, do you want to just do a standalone or do you want to tie into a, the construct above uh, is kind of what you need to be thinking about. And we decided to do a standalone. Um, so we did a wide decompressive uh, laminectomy from three to 10 to kind of give enough space, like Dr. Eskewi mentioned, for the cord to float back. Um, we did instrumentation from uh, 3 to 10. Um, we did not use any allograft. It was autograft only. Um, and there was one area down at the lower segment where the um, ligament of flavum had kind of ossified into the dura, and there was a small durotomy that we repaired intraoperatively. Um, and that is a known thing that can happen when you have 60% canal compromise. That's a predictor that the dura is going to be involved, um, and she was well above that. And as you're going through the videos, um, can you share with us what we did to try to minimize bleeding with the patient? Sure. We used cell saver and two bipolars on our dissection. Then we maintained meticulous hemo, uh, meticulous uh, cautery as we went down, uh, so we didn't have excessive bleeding during the dissection. And so, how much blood did we lose overall then through the procedure? I think it was only about. Uh, 700, 800? Yeah, something like that. But yeah. we used the cell saver throughout, and again, we had bone wax available, two bipolars, yep. and basically the dissection took like twice as long, but we literally fought for every single uh, red cell. So we went uh, just above, I think we went to T3 and undercut the T3 segment, and we used only autograft. Uh, is fusion a concern in these patients, Bob, in your experience? Yeah, I think uh, I still would use... Uh, biologics and uh, uh, aggressive decortication of the facet joints, but uh, obviously they're inclined towards fusion. Uh, so it's, it's not a given. So yeah, we, we had detailed discussions. I think that's the most important part and patients with uh, uh, proclivities against um, uh, transfusion, we had extensive discussions, what she would accept and what she wouldn't. That includes also hemostatic agents. They can be of bovine origin. And so uh, there are some belief systems that basically are, are adamantly against that, although they're genetically denatured. But we used only local bone graft. We're very diligent about that. How easy was the decompression, Chris? How do we do the decompression? Yeah, so we basically made a trough. Um, 
And the decompression actually went very well. The dura for most of it was pristine underneath. Um, the only place that there was some adhesion was at the very bottom. Um, but it well, looked we very through, good. The point is we went through six drill bits or something like that. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, the bone was like concrete. The bone was it, very hard. It was a very arduous, very difficult dissection, I have to say. How about Jens? What was the um, <clears throat> signals like before? Because it looks like a really compromised Great course. Point. She had no motors yeah. in the lower extremities, uh, but she did have sensation. Motors did return after we did the decompression on the left leg. You mean SSCPs? No, motors. And she had yeah. no motors in the lowers. But SSCPs. Those SCPs were there. Yeah. So in a case like this, I typically, Jens, I don't know, I know you do the NASCIS uh, protocol, which I think is reasonable. What do you think about just following the SSCPs rather than, because you'll have what I've found on these cases, you'll have a trace motor and then you'll lose it. That's uh, exactly you yeah. know, what went on here. So that's uh, uh, bingo to the point. We had uh, very shaky MEPs, and again, in principle, we could have just uh, probably watched the SEPs. Yes, we used the NASCIS 2 spinal cord injury protocol. For me, this is a spinal cord injury, and we'll stress the cord more. We used MEPs with a very experienced anesthesiologist, over 85 throughout the procedure, and we knew that we might have to abandon the surgery if uh, she seemed dynamically unstable. We had no uh, reserves, so. But it fortunately, went actually very well, and how's she doing now? She's doing great, actually. Um, sensation is returning to her lower extremities. Um, she's ambulating. She'll probably be discharged, if not today, tomorrow. Yeah, in the near future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So, a, another, any other comments, Bob? Otherwise, we'll ask Dr. Sassino to come up. Any other comments, Bob, on these cases? No, I think that was nicely done. Yeah, we're fortunate. Dr. Sassino has a, another challenging case from the more recent past. Um, and uh, good morning. My name is Amanda Sassino. Um, and like Dr. Chapman just said, I'm going to talk about a case of a patient with a Charcot arthropathy. Um, so this is a 34 year old gentleman. He suffered an incomplete spinal cord injury secondary to a cord infarct from a thoracic AVM as a child. Uh, about 18 years later, he was found to have a Charcot arthropathy. You know, and I just wanna note that in the literature, the arthropathy develops about 17.3 years after the initial trauma. So he was pretty much on, on schedule. Um, he underwent a lumbar fusion for treatment, followed by a series of revisions that you can see on the bottom left, uh, mainly for hardware loosening and or fractured hardware. Um, and this is his most recent exam, which it was his neurologic baseline. Sorry, sorry, Amanda, I'll interrupt you. We had some chat room things just very quickly about the Charcot spine. Mm -hmm. So for Dr. El Wardani, uh, yes, we did a posterolateral fusion after facet decortication only using local bone graft. And Dr. Patari asked a very important question, so thank you for that. Uh, he asked, did we do a decompressive laminectomy first or pedicle screws uh, first? This is a great question. We failed to mention that. We put screws in first and rods and then did the decompression. Uh, the reason for that is that we wanted to be able to bail out at any point in time and at least stabilize her. So great question. So screws and rods first uh, with facetectomies and then uh, basically the decompression. I apologize for the interruption. It's okay. But thank you. Okay, so he had been doing well after his most recent surgery, and this was his most recent construct. Uh, he had a T4 to pelvis with three pelvic screws on each side and a quad rod construct. And one day he came into clinic because he had felt a pop in his lower back with a change in position in bed. So we got imaging and his inner rod on the right had popped out of his L5 and S1 screws. Um, do you want me to go straight to what we did or? No, let's so how far out is he now from the initial post-op? What is the delta of the left images to so the right? So the initial post-op was his surgery prior to his most recent, and then the images on the right were when he represented about one to two months after that surgery. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Hart, so multiple rod constructs have become more and more uh, uh, commonly used. Uh, what happened here? Why does this fail? Should this even be possible to fail? Sorry, how long was that from the procedure? Just About one to months. two months. One to two months. Um, well, uh, so these are, in my experience, these are very difficult patients to get to solidly fuse. Um, and the mechanical forces, first of all, a lot of times they've gained weight, not always. 
but sometimes they're a bit heavy. Secondly, uh, their mobilization uh, is obviously different than ambulatory patients, and they can't really uh, reposition themselves without stressing the lower end of their construct. So I think that's a big part of it. Uh, I'll say in my own experience, this is the first pathology for which I began using multiple rods. And uh, part of that was because I felt uh, or realized you, you don't need to worry about the neurologic elements. And so a number of patients, actually, I've uh, just resected the fecal sac. Some of them don't want that because uh, of the possibility that somewhere down the road, some stem cell technology or some other approach will give them the possibility of, uh, of a spinal cord repair. Uh, but some are accepting of the idea that, that that's just not going to be in their future. And so you can put one set of screws medial and one set of screws more lateral and, and lay rods that way. Uh, we've now developed these other alternative techniques of multi-rod constructs. <clears throat> and so I would be inclined towards uh, something like you've got here. and. And then uh, they all need anterior column support, whether that's done from the back or done from the front. Uh, I think it's very important to get inner body fusions at essentially every level as you've done here. So uh, I'm a little surprised that it failed this early, uh, but uh, I think it's probably due to the factors we just talked about. It looks like a robust construct, so I'm not sure what else you could have done. Amanda, how do you think this failed, this construct? What was the biomechanical force that led to this failure? Um, I think it was probably rotation because it sounded like he was in bed and he rotated to change position and it popped out. I, I would exactly agree. I think there was torsion and flexion involved. Yeah. Now, as I look at this construct, this is the unforgiving nature of spine surgery. This is an extremely difficult, challenging condition. On the patient's side opposite to the red box, if you look at the failure things, there's no sacral fixation. Um, and there's only kind of a side to side connector, kind of this cross connector present. So there's a very, uh, very soft uh, caudal fixation of the construct. On the right side, there's that uh, connection to the sacral screws. So there's a overload, probably an asymmetric overload of the side that then popped out. Uh, I would basically microanalyze. But again, these are extremely difficult cases. Sometimes you just don't have bone. Uh, there's also no side to side connectors between the rods. So there's no load sharing between the rods. So the so called working rod and the spanning rods are kind of uh, separate entities here. So that's my, my one thought. Was he symptomatic from this uh, popped out rod? For what I saw in the, the notes, no. He just had said that he felt a pop, but no sort of back pain or any change in his neurologic exam. Now, Rod, what's this cable uh, thing higher up? There's, there's a cable. Can you put your cursor on the post-op AP where the failure occurred, Amanda? Mm -hmm. So take your cursor over to the rightest most image from our screen. Go, uh -huh. go, go. Yep. So what, what's that cable construct? Doing? So we, um, we actually, uh, so part of um, the thought and reasoning behind this current construct is that um, we put in, we cut a fibula and I basically wired it in. And um, uh, the main area, as you can see here, was trying to get L5 and S1 to fuse. Um, and as you guys pointed out, in fact, I remember uh, like 15 years ago, I did a literature search and you and I think uh, several people at Harborview were the first people that did multi-rods for, for this exact same condition, Jens. Um, and, and the failure of the L5-S1 is pretty high because of the fact that these people are non-ambulatory and they literally, it's like their body is disconnecting, their pelvis is disconnecting from the rest of their body. Um, and the challenging thing with this one, and I think none of the companies have come up with this, is if you look at the distance and how much, I mean, there's no room for, for these wedding bands and then cross connectors are too big. Um, and probably when I look back on, I probably should have put in multiple cross connectors, but the challenge with this case was, is um, there was so much bone growth actually from the other levels. The level that he didn't fuse was at T910 and at L5S1. Um, and so uh, that was the challenging thing on this. Um, and uh, he was asymptomatic and it was just that one rod 
And as you pointed out, Jens, you astutely saw, you know, he really didn't have a great, I had taken out the previous um, sacral screw and I bone grafted, I, you know, I took off basically his ala with an osteotome and put tons of bone graft in there on that, on that one side where there's no sacral screw. Um, and then on that other side, there's three screws, but there's two rods and one goes in the iliac screw and the other two go to the other rod. So um, because it was so early, I talked to him about, you know, the options of going back in. And uh, this kid is like so bright and um, so uh, full of life and really just wants to like get, get this done. So we took him back actually just yesterday. So uh, did you do an anterior in the body fusion? Is that a uh, large? We did, with... yeah. Amanda, can you put your cursor in the second to right image, uh, just on that ALIF? So that's a heroic surgery. We actually uh, stopped doing anterior procedures in the Charcot spines at Harvard. We didn't publish on that, but the approach was quite hellacious due to an inflammatory grind that had formed around there. Yeah, that was, that was an extremely difficult case. Yeah. Yeah, Bob, do you do anterior fusions? I know you like anterior fusions for these multi-level constructs, but uh, have you done anterior procedures for Charcot spines? You know, I have, uh, not in big numbers, and I, I don't remember the, you know, the, I don't remember that being uh, especially difficult in the one or two patients that I did that, but um, as I was talking about, I, I will, you, you can gain, if the patient is uh, accepting of the notion of resection of their fecal sac, you then have access to the discs from the back that's really equivalent to going from the front. I, I, and it's hard to do that. It's hard to make yourself do that. But my own gut sense is that most of these patients that are 20 years out from their injury, there, there is not something promising that's likely to alter their uh, status uh, in coming anytime soon. So I, I think it's not an unreasonable approach to take. So Dr. Hart, whilst you're on the microphone, uh, Dr. Silberstein wants to know um, why so many screws in the pelvis and what kind of screws were they and are they still in good fixation mode? Thank you for the question, Sergio. You, you want me yeah. to? So um, I actually really like uh, the look of the pelvic construct here. And, I, you know, one thing I, one point I would make is the same issue mechanically that led to this failure is also part of what leads to the pathology. And we always think of Charcot joints as being primarily due to loss of protective sensation. Uh, but in the spine in particular, uh, I think there's also this issue of mechanical loading. So these patients, uh, load their spines uh, to a much greater extent than, uh, than, than ambulatory patients. And in addition to that, I think there is a progressive loss of bone density because they're not weight bearing. So uh, at, at a certain point, and Amanda was saying at uh, 18 years in, um, they, you know, the, the, the load bearing resistance of the spine uh, is insufficient for the loads that the patient uh, generates in their mobilization. So it's, it's the same process. Uh, it's a, partly a mechanical, partly biologic due to bone density issues, and then partly lock, lack of protective sensation. Great points. Um, what about the iliac screws? Are they loose now, uh, Rod? Did you check on CTs? Because there seems to be some radial loosency on the digital images, but we never know whether that's uh, yeah. averaging, averaging so, or not. That's an excellent question, but actually, if you look carefully at the CT, he actually has SI joints fused across where the, where the screws went in, and, and they were super robust. Um, and when we went in yesterday, um, the only thing that had failed was that L5S1 um, on the patient's right side. And so we took out the, um, the L5S1 screws, revised the screws, and then um, the other side actually had started to fuse. There's bone growing in and around that cross connector at the bottom. It was encased in bone, um, and so we didn't touch that, um, but we did um, use an osteotome and, uh, and a drill and just really tried to, you know, get that L5S1 area to fuse. Um, and uh, I think the heads, looking back on it, potentially the heads could have splayed. Um, and so I think that's what ended up, that's why it failed so early. I might so. take us forwards. 
So, um, so yeah. as we just discussed, we took him back. Um, and then just in the final revision here, you know, we were talking about adding connectors and cross links, um, which was done and to support some of the stress on that part of the construct. Um, at least from what I've seen, he's doing great after surgery. So um, how big of a, of a surgery was this revision procedure? And what did you do for bone graft? Uh, so you put two connectors on and put new screws into the L5S1 junction, is that it? We put uh, two wedding bands, uh, two new L5S1 screws, and then a cross connector to try it all tied in. Um, and again, on the, on the patient's left side, um, there was a lot of bone posterolaterally, but we've just put tons. We decorticate all the way from T9 down to the pelvis. And, and we the used, um, screws were still tight? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. They yeah, were not. The screw goes very close to the uh, hip joint, but... How and do you put those in? Are those standard uh, iliac screws? So I actually used Alex von Glinsky's paper um, on, on pelvic tra trajectories and anatomy. And I don't know if you can tell see that there, but I tried to angulate it in, in all different angles to try to get the most amount of um, biomechanical uh, utilization. Um, and obviously the... the um, anatomy of the pelvis is trickier because you don't have a lot of um, area in the, and it's mostly cancellous bone. And again, unfortunately, a lot of the companies now, I don't think they have ideal fixation systems. Basically, if you think about it, we're putting in pedicle screws into the ilium. And so I think that's not ideal. And then even the head geometry is not ideal. And then all the connectors and all the dominoes, wedding bands, they're all meant for basically thoracolumbar fixation. So this whole area, I think, is going to need to be revamped in the next several years because it's such an important part of, um, you know, not only this case, but deformity, tumor, trauma cases. Yeah. At 8 o'clock today, Pacific time, we have a manufacturer, no names mentioned, who's actually very interested in lumbar pelvic fixation. So I urge all of us here to quickly look into their... Uh, ad hoc lab. Amanda, you've uh, at Johns Hopkins in your residency seen some of these complex cases. What are your thoughts on Charcot spines, how to get them to fuse? What are some insights biomechanically and biologically from this case? Um, so, you know, I, I think that with a Charcot spine, it's not a question if the construct is going to break down mostly in the patients. I think it's a question of when it's going to break down. You know, and in addition to that, they can also develop the arthropathy at other points within the, the construct, not at just the initial area that you were trying to fuse. So I think it's a very difficult question at this point for us to be able to answer. But I think, you know, more and more as we're developing different approaches to the, si to the spine and different biologics, um, to help promote fusion, you know, that, that hopefully we'll be able to make some headway. But I, I think at this point right now, it's just close monitoring of the patients, you know, not only, you know, in terms of their neurologic exam, but with imaging to see if we can catch, you know, things like this sooner rather than later. So, uh, great point. So, Dr. Susie Fotis, hi. Uh, thanks for your comment. So, I can't mention the manufacturer. Why don't we get the next lecture on? But th thank you, Amanda. Mm -hmm. So, there is a manufacturer that has kind of understood the importance of uh, pelvic fixation. Again, no names mentioned, but uh, Fotis, you guessed that that manufacturer is going to be here at 8 a.m. to show us their forms of pelvic fixation. Many thanks to uh, uh, Amanda for her presentation and insights on Charcot spines, an unresolved issue. I would add to this that uh, in my experience, these patients require rehab consults afterwards to change every little detail on the mobilization from chair to transfer techniques, because they're literally whipping their lower body around. The sitting position changes, so their pressure points change. So they have to be uh, very diligently re-educated in terms of how to transfer, how to decompress, et cetera. How, and the chairs usually have to be changed also. So that's my only additional advice there. Yeah. But I think I totally echo what you said from a manufacturing standpoint. Uh, there's several device people on here. Uh, we do urge you to kind of look at the idiosyncrasies of the lumbar pelvic junction and uh, allow us as surgeons to have better fixation. Would you agree, Bob? Yeah. No, I think that's right on. So, Dr. Hicks, what did you find for us? Um, so, Jim Hicks, uh, stead presentation here. No disclosures. Miss T, she's 67, 
um, history of diabetes, previous kyphoplasties early this year. Can you speak year. closer to the microphone, please? I think yeah. people have a hard time hearing you. Sorry. Um, so previous kyphos, L2, L3, and she's presenting with claudications, really uh, lumbar stenotic symptoms, and um, perhaps worsened radiculopathy on the right lower extremity. Uh, we can see the spondy that she has, L4 on L5. Um, this is her examination. Um, uh, obviously, with some extensor and some uh, dorsiflexion weakness there. And she's hyperreflexic in the lowers. Um, this is the uh, MRI we have preoperatively representing the uh, significant amount of stenosis she has at that four or five level. And so we had decided to address that level specifically. Um, so how, how bad was 3-4, and how does the foraminal anatomy look at 5-1, which is end-stage degeneration? Correct. So uh, I agree with, with both of those statements. 3-4 uh, was not nearly as bad on the axials uh, as 4-5, and so we thought we'd address her symptoms more specifically based on her exam. Um, if you want me to jump ahead to what we did, I can uh, straight away, or we can look more at her x-ray. If you like. So do you have any other preoperative images to show? No, I do not have the uh, preoperative CT scan to scroll through. Um, so I do have Dr. The Silberstein uh, commented uh, how much, and this is also to the previous case, uh, when we have a patient with neurology and poor bone mass, how long do we want to wait until we do the surgery? Should we optimize the bone mass? Yeah. Uh, Rod, do you want to take that on? So yeah. patient has neurology and poor mm -hmm. bone as evidenced by the two level um, uh, uh, kind of cementing. So what do we do there? How do well, we wait and stage? That's a great question. So initially, I think when I got involved in, I've been seeing her for several years, yeah. is that her DEXA was quote unquote normal. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then she developed the uh, uh, lumbar fractures and then she got better um, uh, after the kyphoplasties, but she still had neurogenic claudication, lumbar radiculopathy. And um, I, I had a hard time getting her primary care doctor to actually treat her mm -hmm. because the diff this is why I wanted you to present this case is that she had lumbar fractures, kyphoplasties, and they said to her that, well, maybe you have osteopenia, um, and they finally started treating her for osteoporosis. So this is the difficulty in managing these patients. And I think, I don't know if you, do you have her DEXA, Jimmy? Uh, no, I do But not, her but DEXA, her, so they use yeah. obviously the hip, usually. Mm -hmm. um, and so you get these weird numbers. But then if you look at clinically and look at, show her x-rays, this is a classic case of, you know, where, um, you know, her bone density does not look good in her lumbar spine. Soft tissues there. Exactly. And so this is a very difficult problem. And again, I think it's a primary care issue. It's a, you know, a lot of different factors. And mm -hmm. it's difficult to manage someone like this because if a primary care doc's not willing to treat the underlying condition. Yeah. And so we treated her for like a year, two years. She was on the, um, I think she was on Fosamax, mm -hmm. and then they upgraded her to, um, uh, and but she continued to decline. And so the question is, is what do you do in someone with, who has osteoporosis? And essentially has adjacent. Yeah, and it's got adjacent level risk. disease, yeah. Yeah. Well, Jimmy, do you remember the Hounsfield units in non-cemented vertebra? So she, and that's something I was going to mention, if you do the ROI circle on your CT scan, you can um, determine how osteopenic they, they are based on those Hounsfield units. And usually, to my understanding, less than 100, you're, you're getting more concerned. Yeah, 110, but um, yeah, 100 is kind of gets into red flag territory. And how so low she, was it? So hers, the lowest I could find was really around 85 or so. Um, and so it really... Maybe it's the sclerosis she has around those end plates that we're throwing the Hounsfield units off yeah, no, uh, tremendously. Make the but, circles appropriate, obviously. Right. So you can't engage sclerotic bone. Did mm -hmm. you get a CAT scan before surgery? Uh, she did. And do we have a flexion extension film? She did. So yeah. she had that. And then I think the significant thing to show here on this MRI is perhaps some of the dynamic instability that she did have at 4.5 that reduces being supine. So, Bob, that's an age-old question. So you have multi-level caudal disease, three levels. Uh, one level is clearly unstable. One is vertically collapsed. The other one is kind of at 3-4, that is. 
uh, in a transition breakdown. And then you have compromised vertebrate L2, L3, which have been nicely treated with cementing. Where do you start? Where do you stop? And is fusion a necessary adjuvant to a decompression surgery? Yeah, well, those are, uh, you know, these are still, I think, uh, somewhat unanswered questions with respect to data, right? So this case kind of illustrates the art of spine surgery to, to my thinking. And uh, I think there are surgeons that would do just a decompression without fusion. There are surgeons that would do a decompression and fusion of four or five only. And then there are surgeons that would probably do a longer construct. Um, you know, this one for me, I, those decisions would be based on, you know, uh, long conversations with the patient and a uh, close review of the imaging. Um, and I'm not sure that any of those are really unreasonable approaches. Uh, and as I said, I'm not sure that there's data to suggest that one approach is better than another. Uh, so if she's, if she's got uh, proximal degenerative disease uh, that we're not seeing here, uh, you know, that might push you towards a long, longer construct. Um, if, uh, if her health status supports uh, only something like a laminectomy, that might push you in that direction. So there are all these other features that, uh, that come into the decision making, and a large part of it is what the patient's expectations are. And I guess you should add to the other, the, there's yet another option, which is to not operate on her. What about uh, Rod not doing a fusion and decompressing four or five and putting an interspinous stabilizer? I'm not going to mention the manufacturer here, but some interspinous stabilization device that's FDA approved. So uh, that's an excellent point and something I considered. Uh, the only thing that worried me about this is see the orientation of her facet joints. Um, and then she's so dynamically unstable, and she was a big, rather larger patient, um, but I think those are all uh, great points and, and things that we discussed and I thought about. So. so, so yeah, so Jimmy, can you use your cursor and point the facet joint? So she actually has a great case of facet tropism. So the, the patients, yeah, stay on one side with the cursor. Yeah, so this was like a, actually a 45 degree, uh, 45 degree <laughs> Sorry, angle. And the other side is in about 60 degree <laughs> angle. So this is called facet tropism. This, put your cursor on the other side, Jimmy. Yes, sir. Yep. Whoa. Okay, yeah. So this is a steep Don't angle look. on one side and a, a oblique angle on the other side. So this is facet tropism. This is asymmetry of the facet joints. It's been heralded as one of the potential causes for degenerative spondylolisthesis. Uh, but I don't see a fluid sign here. There's a small fluid sign on the right side, but so I'm not sure how unstable is. I would have uh, either... Go back to the plain x-rays. Do we have the flexion extension x-rays? Sadly, we don't. Uh, yeah. No, but they... So there was is, some slight dynamic, and yeah. what I was hoping to show is really that supine MRI yeah. and see some of that yeah. reduction there. So what would you do, Jens? I don't know. I mean, I think Bob hit it on the head. You have to just understand what the patient wants. And I always am cursed with the thought of, I want to either have just the minimum necessary procedure or the, uh, the more uh, big time solution. Again, I would either have uh, thought about a mm -hmm. decompression and a interspinous stabilization at four or five only. Five one looks like she has severe foraminal disease to me. The other part of me would have fused her L4 to S2, S2 meaning sacral airless screws as a supplement with inner body fusion at both levels mm -hmm. and a decompression only at 3-4. I suspect that 3-4 would have had lateral recess stenosis, but I don't know that in absence of imaging. So those are my two extremes. Uh, Bob, uh, I know I put you on the spot before. Inner spinal stabilization, any option here or is this something you've done? You know, I did a couple of them early on, and one of them, the patient just came back uh, really unhappy and, and angry over, you know, and obviously it's a very minimally interventional procedure. Uh, there is data that supports it, obviously, in the FDA trials. I, I just have no personal experience to comment from. All right. So you showed us what you did. I did. So you did an intermediate surgery? Yes, we chose middle ground. I think... I think it's probably best addressed what her complaints were and then what we could see on her examination and, and given her films. Um, so we, we did the T-LIF L4-5 with some cement augmentation. Um, and obviously we got great spread with the uh, cement that we were utilizing. And part of my focus today would be to talk a little bit about that cement and, and how we use it. Um, Here's a CT slice. Um, 
and hopefully it's showing up well on all screens here. Um, but you can see these finished rated screws that we were utilizing and the ability to uh, kind of extricate that cement into the vertebral body and appropriately and further enough distal uh, to avoid the canal. And Dr. Hicks, how many cc's did you use per screw? Ooh, uh, great question. I think I think we only used about maybe two. two we used half. about two, two and a half. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so an interesting comment and something that Dr. Skubin brought up during the, the operation is a lot of times you can see this, this cement uh, perhaps around the surrounding uh, venous plexus, um, et cetera, of the, of the vertebral body. Um, and so that's something to note here. You can just see that little bleb here where the cement kind of travels locally within that, that local blood flow. Um, and that is noted in studies uh, that I'll show here in a second. But um, how'd the patient do? Um, so she did very well. Um, she had some pain postoperatively that got better, um, but she's already discharged home. Um, I was going to have a brief introduction to cement augmentation here. Essentially, it's PMMA. Dr. Charnley is one of the more modern pioneers uh, with this and his Charnley hip, utilizing the intramedullary uh, fixation of cement and PMMA. Um, there are ingredients of the monomer and the polymer. Uh, you have the liquid toxic monomer, and then you have the copolymer and the powder. Many different formulations, and essentially the different brands will have your different amounts of each one of these, and, and including initiator, accelerator, stabilizer, and, and inhibitor chemicals, cold and hot curing. There's an exothermic polymerization that occurs, and uh, the temperature at which this occurs uh, leads to its uh, curing time. It can be mixed with bone graft as well. Um, here's an example of uh, how the curing process works, and that's that blue zone that you're really looking for for the manipulation of the cement and its utilization. Here's an example of the ingredients of one versus another uh, uh, company, and they are essentially really the same ingredients. And if we're talking about the safety and efficacy of cement, um, there's a low risk of clinically significant extravasation through fenestrated screws. Cement leakage most commonly occurred uh, through segmental veins. Um, and so uh, we could see just a touch of that, uh, in, even in our case. Um, especially lateral wall or vertebral body uh, breach, they've noticed to be more common with these segmental veins. But again, you don't want the medial wall breach because then you really risk the spinal canal and that base, base vertebral vein. Um, cement uh, pulmonary embolism can occur, um, although it was asymptomatic in this study's one patient that had that. Global Spine Journal has reviewed uh, cement and its cost effectiveness, and it was a very interesting article where there was a 3% 3 3 revision rate in the cement augmentation group versus 14% without. Uh, this 11% reduction was right around the number they anticipated to actually be cost effective for these patients. When you actually look at the cost of hospitalization, revision, everything all together. Um, so a couple of very interesting articles there. Great. Thank you, Jimmy. All right. Final case of the morning, Dr. Avila is going to come up. Maurizio has prepared a case of Dr. Hart, so that'll segue into the presentation. And thank you, Dr. Hicks. So, Rod, as Maurizio is getting his talk up, uh, is there a specific Hounsfield unit that you then use cement on pretty routinely? Is there a critical number that you have in mind? Not really, but I think on a case like that, that's why I wanted to bring it up. You know, intra-op, the bone was horrible. Um, and then uh, and then she had those fractures above. So I think she was going to fracture if I didn't put cement. Um, I think I'm more likely to do it on tumors in patients that have previous fractures. So we've had three different case scenarios, a hyperbone form with OPLL, a Charcot spine with severely neuropathic bone that's healing impaired, and a severely osteoporotic patient where cement is used to kind of help stabilize things until maybe there's a fusion. And now we have... Um, Dr. Avila with a fourth variant of challenges. Okay, um, so Mauricio Avila, I'm one of the spine fellows. This is a 51-year-old <clears throat> female who presented to the spine clinic with severe back pain and bilateral leg pain. Her pain radiated uh, from her low back into her upper thighs. She was having, having trouble walking and standing straight. She denied any falls or trauma <clears throat> Sorry, uh, prior to this presentation. 
Um, she lived outside of Seattle, so she had pain for about six months and, you know, was calling the clinic until she finally uh, came um, to see us. Relevant medical history is quite extensive, but I put a couple of the relevant to her. She has neurofibromatosis, which was the main reason she got her initial surgery. She had a scoliosis surgery. Uh, she was quite obese. Um, she had asthma, sleep apnea, GERD. Her first surgery um, was a scoliosis, uh, adult scoliosis surgery at T10 to pelvis in 2013. She underwent um, L5 and S1 ALFs in 2014. And probably given her obesity, she was high risk for wound infection. And unfortunately, she had a couple of revisions for wound infection and a partial hardware removal in 2008. Um, given her chronic pain, she also had an intrathecal pain pump and multiple uh, abdominal surgeries, including hysterectomies, cholecystectomies, and gastric bypass. Um, by the time we saw her um, motor, she was um, motor intact. Mainly, it was a sensory disturbances with diminished sensation in, in her uh, left foot and the lateral aspect of her leg. Just jumping into the imaging at presentation. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, uh, AP and lateral x-rays, you're going to try to uh, point your eyes to a couple of uh, critical spots um, in her um, imaging. As you can see, she had two points of uh, rod fracture on the left-hand side. And importantly, let me try to bring the pointer. Um, here you can see at the L5-S1 level, uh, it, there's a fracture through her prior uh, fusion mass. You can see it here on the sagittal here and here. Um, this axial, just to show where she had a prior uh, pelvic screw, and you can see the degeneration in her SI joint. So this is the first pause to what to do. First pause, I like that. <laughs> so this is, so briefly, Bob, before we go into bone healing and metal, and I know you're gonna give your great presentation that I've seen before. I hope the audience enjoys it as much as I did. How does biomechanics and alignment add to non-unions in the lumbopelvic junction as eye arthropathies? Is there a problem when we have a patient who's forward tilted, like what she seems to be? Yeah, I think you've you've hit on uh, probably part of the problem. So this this woman, uh, you know, obviously is for me a legacy uh, patient. Um, she really is a delightful person, uh, and um, somehow continues to come back for more uh, following some of these failures. And as I look at that, I do think, gosh, I really didn't get enough lordosis in the early construct. Um, the, the history was, I think, as uh, Dr. Avila uh, described, uh, as I remember it, the first construct I did, we stopped at L4. Uh, she fused, but then she, that was T10 to L4, but then she broke down below that. And I think I did a staged extension to her pelvis with a lifts at 4.5 and 5.1. And she developed at that point a posterior wound infection. Uh, so um, we got her through all of that. She did solidly heal below. And I certainly regret taking out her pelvic screws, and I'm not sure, I don't recall what the indication for that was, but at a certain point we took out her pelvic fixation, which uh, I think is one contributor here. Uh, the second contributor might be her size, and then the third contributor I think is her spinal alignment, as you've uh, identified. Uh, to my recollection, she's the only patient I've ever had that has, well, that's not true, but so I've had patients few, uh, fracture through posterior fusion masses that have hardware removal. Uh, this is the first one I recall that had intact hardware, solid anterior column fusion, uh, and yet then developed a breakdown uh, over time at that level. And so that's the clinical problem that we uh, identified here. I tell patients, uh, and this is a, a potential future research subject, uh, that when we do long fusions, it's like concrete, which requires rebar in it, and the rebar has a certain carrying function. Bone alone below a lo lo long fusion would not hold up. Is that a fair uh, kind of a comparison? Yeah, I agree. And that may have been the sequence here is that, uh, you know, ultimately the hardware failed, and then that made the fusion construct vulnerable and, and subsequently it failed. I, I suspect it was a two-stage failure, not a immediate uh, both. What type of neurofibromatosis did she have? What oh, does she have? Uh, I don't remember that. It's, uh, I don't remember. I think it's neurofibromatosis type one. Type one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, bone healing, how's bone healing in an NF patient? 
I have a good question. I don't know. Probably yeah. not. You have to speak closer to the microphone. Sorry. I'm, I don't know the actual answer. Great. And routine fusions of the pelvis, should we nowadays routinely seek a serious fusion of the SI joints? I mean, this is a great learning case from so many regards for myself and for all of us. Uh, these SI joints, when we have long fusions, clearly uh, become gaseous and amorphous and look like this is a stress reaction. Should we fuse to the SI joint or should we just instrument to the SI, uh, to the pelvis? I still don't do uh, a formal fusion in my standard construct, but when I'm, you know, in this woman, I think you're you're uh, right on, and you know, she, how many more failures can we uh, tolerate? And uh, and she does have gas now in the SI joints, so uh, I think it factors into the decision making in a revision case like this for sure. And did you have a previous ALIF in her? Was there an anterior in a body fusion at five one that then? Broke yes, through? yes, that's, that's an ALIF. Yeah, it's a femoral ring. Yeah. So this is again remarkable to me. This is a fully integrated allograft by all looks of it, and there's just this little millimeter of a toggle. And for our neurosurgical colleagues, for bone healing, this one millimeter is the worst uh, because that's the that exceeds the osteocyte jumping distance. It's actually better to have a larger gap because then several osteocytes can link together or osteoblasts can link together, but a single one can exceed the kind of a stretch capability of osteoblasts. So a small defect. Um, that is unstable is way worse than a large defect. Fair? Uh, well, I, I haven't heard the phrase osteocyte jumping distance in many years, so I'm, I welcome hearing that back in the conversation. I'm not sure I know the science, but I like the yeah, it is phrase. Actually, yeah, uh, the reference is Ted Gross. He, I happen to know it because he's a great UW professor. And, yeah, John so Callahan used to use it in my, yeah. uh, in my personal history. And it should be osteoblast. I misspoke. It's oh, yes. not osteocyte, osteoblast jumping Correct. distance. Okay, Maurizio. Okay, so given her severe pain and ability to walk and, and the hardware failure as we've been talking about, uh, she got admitted from the clinic to the hospital to take her for a vision. And she also wanted the pain pump out because she, you know, it basically was put in because of her severe back pain. Um, so the procedure was removal of the pain pump, removal of the hardware with replacement and a new segmental instrumentation from L1 to S1, pelvic fixation as we were talking about, and SI joint fusion as well. Um, this is her post-op imaging. Uh, I just up the AP um, x-ray, uh, but I want to bring your attention now to change that occur at the L5-S1 level. Wow. Um, so it's after, you know, this revision, this level is now uh, wider. You can see also in the coronal, there's, there's a wider gap. Um, so this led to the decision to um, take her for another surgery in the same hospital state to now revise anterior, her ALIF, which is wow. this result. Uh, so this was her pre-op after the first revision where we see the widening at the L5-S1, and this is her post-op with the revision of the ALIF. So this patient actually wanted to be more lordotic. Is that what I'm seeing here? You know, I think we've got a clinical photo. Do you have the photo? Of I, I have the initial presentation to the, the last follow-up we have. Okay, yeah. so uh, despite the appearance, and you can see there in the lateral, she actually stands reasonably well. Um, you know, these these x-rays I've acknowledged, uh, it's not my finest work in terms of <laughs> deformity correction and alignment. But if you look at her pelvic stance on the AP film too, she, she is... Uh, uh, relatively uh, balanced. She's not retroverting her pel pelvis uh, a great deal. Uh, so we did, I think, at the initial revision, um, try to lordose her a bit more. We got a few more degrees. I obviously didn't try for a home run here. We didn't try to do anything through the uh, proximal fusion mass. Um, and as I recall, I think uh, there was always a plan, Mauricio, maybe the, the notes may have reflected differently, but my plan was always to do a revision ALIF on her, I believe. Yep. How did you do that? Ipsilateral approach, transperitoneal, contralateral? Well, that ended up being a complicated uh, <laughs> procedure. She'd had uh, abdominal surgeries uh, for other reasons and had a mesh in. Uh, I had uh, our vascular surgery colleague uh, help me with the approach, and uh, I think it was transperitoneal. It actually went well, uh, but then as, as we removed the retractors, we recognized that there actually had been a, a division of the small intestine uh, 
likely due to uh, adhesions, I think, to the mesh. Uh, and it was a retraction injury. It was obviously nothing sharp. It was just the, the force of the retractor uh, pulled the intestine either off the mesh or pulled it in half somehow. So that was a complication I hadn't previously experienced, but our uh, our surgical colleagues from First Hill came over and, and performed a, an immediate repair, and, and she actually ended up doing quite well. She had some wound healing issues in front, uh, but ultimately got that closed as well. So hopefully, touch wood, she's now two years out, and I think we're uh, hopefully never going to uh, have to operate on her again. I don't, did you have any of the CT scans showing the SI fusion on post-op? Or um, I don't, actually. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't that's fine. Did they heal? I believe they did, yeah. How do you fuse, fuse them? Just put uh, uh, mostalized bone graft in? Or I, I use a structural graft. I'll cut a fibular allograft into Bells, sort of a corpectomy yeah. size. Yeah, and and then uh, I, I use BMP in these uh, fusions yeah. as well. Bob McGuire described that technique originally, these dowels, fibular dowels into the SI. Right, I think right, it's very, right. Tell us about, S, uh, I, and then we'll go to your talk, uh, iliac fixation. So S2AI versus ilium has kind of almost become a religious warfare. What are your thoughts and what have you used? I mean, I do a lot of uh, four rod constructs now. And so uh, as for the patient of rods that we showed with the Charcot spine, I think uh, multiple uh, pelvic screws uh, to me seems to offer uh, the most stable base. I typically will use two on either side and one goes in as an S2AI trajectory and then the other one goes more laterally, not fully up on PSIS, but uh, about two thirds the way up, let's say on the iliac wing uh, in the, in the uh, wound, just proximal a touch and uh, lateral a touch. I thought this is a very illustrative case. Thanks for sharing that in terms of bone healing and the interaction, the ongoing interaction, even in a solid fusion, right Maurizio of bone? Uh, healed bone and the posterior yeah, hardware. So there's a symbiosis kind of that you want to reach at some point in time. Any thoughts from your end? I think it just reminds me that you think you're safe, but then something happens, right? You think the fusion is going to hold, but then there's 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 always something that can happen, like in her case, like it, it fractures through the L5-S1, there was a, there was a fusion. And and I think, you know, and Dr. Hart and I were talking about a couple of weeks ago in clinic, that removing the hardware in this long construct you have to have very, very good reasons because you know you start following this patient that you see there's something is going to happen despite having solid bone fusion on CT. I think well said. Well, thank you for putting that together. Maritza put that together late last night. So special recognition to our four fellows who presented nicely. And this is a great segue case to Dr. Hart, who's a recognized expert in hardware failures and. Uh, long fusions. Uh, he's a senior member of the ISSG. He's one of my partners. And um, he's taking a special interest in minimizing complications in long fusion constructs through a variety of techniques. And um, again, he has uh, become very sought after for his uh, thoughts on preventing and minimizing hardware failure, which we saw uh, at least two cases uh, thereof, and um, hopefully none in the other cases, but um, not a trivial deal and quite common, and there are multiple different divergent insights. So the symbiosis of metal and fusion, Dr. Hart, nobody better than you to educate us on that. Thanks for doing this. Oh, well, thank you for your eloquent uh, introduction. That's very kind, and uh, really, it's uh, always fun to present here uh, locally to our own group and our own fellows. So, uh, really appreciate the uh, venue uh, here at SSF. So, I do have some conflicts. Uh, uh, these are mostly uh, design-related. None of them specific to the these topics. So uh, as we've identified, rod fracture continues to be a significant uh, problem for us when we do longer fusions and particularly uh, thoracal lumbar fusions and particularly when we include uh, pelvic fixation and or fusion to the pelvis, I should say. Uh, these are some numbers from various uh, reviews. The, the, the article at the bottom was an ISSG-based article from uh, Justin Smith at uh, uh, UVA, and uh, he found a total of about 9% uh, among the entire uh, patient group uh, suffered rod fractures, and that went up to 22% when a three-column osteotomy had been performed. So that's a specific instance uh, that we uh, need to be cognizant of. 
There are a number of risk factors. Uh, obviously, mechanical loads due to obesity uh, create a higher rate of rod fracture. Uh, medical comorbidities, which may block uh, bone healing, uh, are, are also factors. If we've had a wound infection, it's a particular issue, and uh, I think I've in some patients um, uh, done longer anterior interbody fusions to make sure that we get a solid fusion anteriorly if we've got uh, a grossly infected posterior wound after the construct. Uh, revision situations where we're working through previously operated fusion uh, mass uh, is another one. And as we've identified just previously, three column osteotomy. I'm a big believer in bone morphogenic protein that also in particular in deformity cases or multi-level fusions, uh, that is an off-label use of BMP uh, in many cases. but. Um, but it is uh, shown within the, again, the ISSG data that there is definitely a higher rate of uh, successful fusion among patients that receive BMP as opposed to those who don't. Uh, and then uh, if the patient comes in on beast phosphonates, I think those have to be uh, weaned prior to any kind of a substantial uh, fusion surgery as those do also interfere with bone fusion. And then the one factor that's within our control is how we instrument the patient. And so I think increasingly uh, we're looking at how we can optimize uh, rod diameter, uh, rod material, uh, and uh, the number of rods we use. So. Um, bigger, better, more has kind of been uh, a little bit of a, a little bit of a pattern over the last uh, several years. So uh, th this is uh, data from uh, that Alan Daniels uh, looked at again out of the ISSG database, um, comparing the rates of rod fracture in patients that are instrumented to upper thoracic versus lower thoracic. Uh, stopping points and really uh, the rate of rod fracture as you see in the lower li uh, line there was not significantly different uh, between the two and I think what that relates to is the location of where we see the rod fractures so we don't see rod fractures in the thoracic spine much most of them occur down in the uh, lum lumbar spine and a lot of times particularly in the lower lumbar spine. The timing of this complication typically is after 12 months postoperatively. I think if we see it in the very early months postoperatively, that is an anomaly, but it can happen. As you see here, a couple of patients, or I guess just one patient less than three months, two patients in the three to six month time window. I've seen it in my own patients even beyond five years. Uh, so uh, it can, I, I don't know what the, what the moment where you say uh, that the patient is fully solidly healed and out of the woods, I'm not sure that we we have that. Five years typically is enough. You know, if they're still solid at five years, uh, typically uh, th that remains solid, but, uh, but not always. So uh, I, I think these patients need kind of lifelong follow up. And this was some work that we did uh, looking at the benefit of, uh, of trying to assess fusion uh, quality without uh, rod fracture. So uh, there's a grading scale to assess the uh, robustness of the fusion mass based on plain radiographs. Uh, what we found was that that had very little uh, relation to clinical outcome. Uh, and on the other hand, rod fracture, which is an indication of the bone uh, you know, fusion quality uh, and really of, of the failure of the bone fusion quality is strongly related to clinical outcome. So here's a couple of slides out of that uh, paper showing on the left, uh, equivalent clinical outcomes uh, with a high-grade fusion mass versus a low-grade fusion mass. As long as the rods are intact, it really doesn't matter. On the right, what you see is the outcomes for patients that have had rod fracture on the, uh, the first line here, uh, just rod fracture, all comers. And the, then these are patients that have had rod fracture that subsequently underwent revision. So another point that comes out of this is that not every rod fracture, not every patient with a rod fracture necessarily needs a revision. If their clinical outcome is not that impaired, uh, impacted, then, uh, then you don't necessarily have to do it. The way the clinical impact develops is number one, pain, and that's what this measures, Oswestry Disability Index, but it also can create uh, recurrent deformity. So uh, that can be yet another reason why uh, patients 
undergo revision. Uh, and here are some similar results, not quite statistically significant, but close. Uh, again, equivalent outcomes uh, with high grade or low grade fusion mass, uh, but uh, impacted outcomes once rod fracture has occurred. And <clears throat> Uh, the, I, the fellows better leave here knowing about the lumbar stif stiffness disability index. Uh, otherwise, I'll be very insulted and uh, and, and petulant. But uh, uh, the, this is an index measuring the functional uh, effects of stiffness as opposed to pain. And I think interestingly here, you see that among these same cohorts, uh, again, not much difference based on fusion mass, uh, but rod fracture and rod fracture with revision actually experienced uh, a bigger, a greater sense of disability due to stiffness, even though presumably with a rod fracture, you've got restored mobility, right, uh, through the spine, but they're not able to access that mobility due to pain, I think is, is the, the message there. So in conclusion, uh, plain radiographic measures of fusion have apparently limited clinical utility, uh, but rod fracture is a much better correlate with clinical outcome and, uh, and in fact does often lead to a need for revision surgery due to pain or recurrent deformity. Again, here's an example of a patient that does not need a revision despite a rod fracture, and it can happen in patients that have uh, a robust solid fusion. So this one is unilateral. You can see that the other rod is not. I've had a number of patients of my own come in uh, at some point in their follow-up with a unilateral rod fracture, and typically those are fairly clinically silent. Some of them do go on to bilateral rod fracture, so it does, again, warrant follow-up, but uh, we, we operate on patients not on not on pictures or radiographs, and finding a rod fracture, it's a concern, uh, but if the patient is relatively asymptomatic and the uh, fusion mass looks solid, uh, it's not necessarily something that needs to be clinically or surgically addressed. So tips and pearls, uh, how do I uh, try to reduce the incidence of this in my own patients? Again, I'm a proponent of osteobiologics. I've already uh, indicated that. If patients have bone density issues, I try to get them on Forteo preoperatively. Uh, sometimes that's difficult with, uh, insur with insurers. Uh, it's a very expensive medication still. And uh, if we don't get insurance coverage, most patients can't afford it on their own. Uh, osteoporotic patients, typically we can get uh, coverage, but osteopenia uh, is also for me. If I can get Forteo, I'd prefer to uh, treat them preoperatively and then during the perioperative uh, period for up to two years. Uh, alignment planning, and we talked about this in the patient of mine we just showed, I think is key in getting, getting balance in both uh, coronal and particularly in sagittal plane, uh, I think is a key element in uh, avoiding rod fracture as well. I like an A-lift at 5.1 if that's a tall disc. We talked about that in, uh, in several settings. Um, for me, I get a better fill of the disc uh, from the front, and I think it still uh, may uh, warrant uh, a, a separate approach. I do that typically now in a delayed fashion, so the posterior approach, get the deformity correction, get the decompression and instrumentation, and then you can let the patient uh, uh, discharge home or to a rehab uh, facility for several weeks and come back at four to six weeks. They're nutritionally replete, their blood counts are restored, and so doing it as a second stage, I think we, we know that two-stage surgery creates a higher complication rate than one-stage surgery. It makes sense, it's two surgeries, uh, but I think part of it is also that we have to, uh, with previous paradigms, uh, do the two surgeries in relative timing, uh, proximity, uh, close to to each other because if we do the ALIF first, uh, I think it's a lot of us are nervous that uh, the inner body devices might displace if we don't take them in and do the posterior operation. If you do the posterior operation, they're stable and you can let them, uh, you can delay that second stage and I think that in my experience has really uh, helped reduce the complication rates uh, in between the surgeries. I do inner bodies at any level that we decompress fully with a midline laminectomy. Uh, and uh, uh, many of those done as a T-lift at the in index operation. Uh, I, again, there, if 
the blood loss is creeping up, if the duration of the surgery is uh, extending, uh, we can delay those inner bodies and do those now uh, obliquely with a, a lateral approach at, uh, at any level above 5.1. Uh, I know a lot of surgeons are using the same techniques at 5.1. I haven't yet tried that. For me, 5.1 uh, and a lot of times 4.5 is an, a level that I want to do with an approach surgeon in a straight anterior um, uh, method. Uh, increasing the rod diameters. This is now, I think, something that has been adopted really widely, uh, and um, all systems now have at least a 6.0, if not a 6.35 rod. Um, I have not been uh, a fan of uh, cobalt chrome uh, based on some late infections, similar to what we used to see with stainless steel. So I am still using titanium, even though it's a somewhat weaker alloy than uh, cobalt chrome. And there are other alloys now coming to, uh, to the fore that I'll uh, touch on later that may impact what we choose as a device. Um, I, we've already talked about pelvic fixation. I think that's a very important. Uh, I'm a proponent of bilateral pelvic fixation and uh, dual pelvic screws uh, bilaterally, and I'll show some examples of that. And then I do use electrical stimulators externally. I think uh, there's, uh, for me, sufficient data to support their benefit, and uh, it's something that's non-invasive and uh, tolerated by uh, patients readily, I think. And then, uh, as, as I've indicated, not only are we using uh, different uh, alloys, and, uh, perhaps, and different diameter rods, but we're beginning to span high-risk regions with three or four rods. And for me, it is now typically four, not just three rods. So here's, here's a, a the time, a collection of some of the devices available, and I think that's really been a key improvement in spinal instrumentation over the last uh, five to 10 years is kind of the modularity uh, so that we can uh, connect to prior uh, implants, but not only that, we can uh, interconnect the implants we put in at the index operation. And I would add to this picture now dual head screws as well, which I think is, is also uh, helpful. So here's some case examples, a couple of views of uh, Lake Union there uh, uh, in Seattle to enjoy as, a, as a, uh, an intermission. So here are some uh, case examples. This was a woman I took care of a number of years ago in Portland, uh, and uh, she was a delightful lady, uh, always came to my clinic with her mom and with uh, some other friends and relatives. Uh, it was always a large group, and it was always it seemed to me to be something that they sort of enjoyed doing. Uh, but she had had several efforts at uh, fusion, and you can see that those had not uh, worked out well for her. Um, and uh, we, this was an early uh, patient that I did uh, using three rods, and the, the third rod here was sort of a long interconnector uh, here at the top connecting to the left or the right-sided rod and at the bottom uh, connecting via uh, cross members to the uh, right-sided rod, sorry, the left-sided rod. And then we did a second stage in her uh, inner body fusions as well and uh, were able to get a nice uh, solid uh, fusion uh, and she had a nice clinical outcome as a result of that. Here's an example around uh, PSOs, and this is a slightly different approach than I would take now, and I'll highlight that uh, as we get into it. This is a patient that had kind of uh, a potpourri of uh, different implants. He'd had a successful posterior fusion or inner body fusion at 4-5, uh, a non-union with uh, uh, either BAK or Ray cages here at 5-1, uh, and then an inner spinous process device, as we were talking about early, earlier, that doesn't seem to have given him much benefit here at the 3-4 level. And clearly uh, uh, impaired sagittal alignment. So this was one that we did a, a single PSO with a T-lift above, so that's a, a Frank Schwab type for osteotomy, and then the level above that, uh, kind of my version of the interdiscal osteotomy, uh, which is an, uh, a posterior 
um, uh, facetectomy unilaterally uh, with an inner body and then a, a, a you know a, a aggressive uh, mobilization of the opposite, uh, the contralateral facet joint so that we can get lordosis. And in my hands, that gets about 13, up to 13 to 14 degrees per level. Uh, and I felt we needed both in this gentleman. Uh, and then uh, this was one where we did in the same stage an ALIF at 5.1. Uh, removed the inner body cages and, and then turned him over and did the posterior operation. And uh, he also was very grateful and happy with this outcome. What I would do differently now here, this, uh, I, these are uh, outrigger rods, not satellite rods on the, uh, across the osteotomy. And now I would have those off of the main construct, not uh, connected by a cross connector. So I put uh, a satellite rod spanning the pedicle screws above and below the pedicle subtraction osteotomy. And in my thinking, and I don't think it's been looked at mechanically um, or biomechanically, and I may be wrong about that, uh, the, the, the surgeon that came up with that concept, I think is Manish Gupta, that's who I learned it from, uh, but to me, uh, mechanically, if you think about that, what that does is it changes a uh, three-column osteotomy into a one-level T-lift, more or less. All you've got to heal is that one-level inner body. And not only is it now a one-level T-lift, it's protected by the uh, the longer construct from seeing much load. So you, you end up with a construct that uh, is, should have a very high fusion rate. And one of the things that's important to recognize is you need inner body fusions at every level of uh, uh, around the PSO. So both above and below, there has to be a solid inner body fusion. That was part of why we chose L4 as the osteotomy level in this gentleman as the PSO level, uh, because 4.5 was already fused, so we didn't have to worry about that. Uh, but the, the, the issue is you remove so much bone posteriorly that you're never going to get a posterior column fusion. So you have to have an anterior column fusion if you've done a PSO. Uh, early in the teachings and approach to PSO, surgeons were trying to bring the posterior column together uh, with bony apposition in order to get fusion, but you raise your neurologic complication rate if you do that because you are potentially uh, pinching the, the nerve roots with, with the posterior column. Uh, or if not immediately at surgery, you're creating a situation where they can develop a compressive hematoma postoperatively. And here's a patient that taught me that four rods is better than three. Uh, this was a woman I did uh, several years ago, I think about five years ago here in, uh, at, uh, at, in Seattle at uh, SNI. And this was our initial construct. Well, wait a minute. No, sorry. No, sorry, let me go back. This is a patient that uh, demonstrates my current approach with uh, four rods. This is not one we had to revise, thankfully. And uh, this is sort of my standard construct currently. Uh, I will stop the outrigger rods at T12, whether we go to T10 or to upper uh, thoracic spine. And this lady, uh, obviously, we went to upper thoracic spine. But again, non-union and rod fracture is really almost never an issue in uh, above thoracal lumbar junction. Uh, and uh, so far with this woman, so far uh, she's done nicely. One further example of a four rod construct in a patient that at the cervical thoracic junction, typically, uh, truthfully, I think that we see uh, less of an issue in uh, cervical and cervical thoracic spine uh, than we do at lumbopelvic junction. Uh, but uh, there are patients for whom it's still potentially an issue. And this was a gentleman I wanted to make sure we got a solid fusion on. Uh, he had just a small uh, upper thoracic scoliosis which had created a compensatory scoliosis of the uh, cervical spine. Uh, and uh, you can see that maybe better on the AP view here. Uh, but his clinical problem, the worst clinical problem, was not the deformity, but uh, cervical myelopathy due to three discs here with the significant cord compression, as you can see. Uh, so this was one that I felt we should do anterior and posterior in order to get adequate uh, decompression and alignment. I chose to do the posterior operation first because I wasn't completely confident that if we went in front and straightened the neck and coronal plane that I could get a compensatory um, uh, realignment in the uh, thoracic spine. So by going in the back, we got a balanced uh, uh, coronal uh, alignment between the cervical and thoracic 
classic constructs, uh, added an outrigger rod, as you can see, uh, spanning the uh, spanning the main construct, and then turned him over and did the A-lifts. And you can see here the posterior column osteotomies. These are a typical um, ponte osteotomy, uh, let's say, in the uh, posterior column of the thoracic spine. And this is our uh, plain X-ray, and he's been uh, very happy, and I believe solidly fused now uh, about a year and a half out. And those are the inner bodies. So uh, here are a few examples of patients requiring uh, revision for rod fracture, and that was what I was thinking of one of these that I'll get to here in a minute. Uh, this was a woman that I took care of, again, a number of years ago uh, in, uh, who had uh, significant camptochormia and uh, obviously high th thoracic and thoracolumbar kyphosis uh, due to Parkinson's disease, also affected by osteopenia. Uh, and we were able to get her on Forteo and uh, treat her through uh, preoperatively and postoperatively. Uh, but despite that, she ended up with a rod fracture and a pseudarthrosis uh, down at the L4-5 level. Uh, I'll explain these briefly. This was a first approach to um, uh, proximal junctional uh, protection or soft landing, as people uh, sometimes call it, or a tether. Uh, this is a vector device uh, which is a rib cradle, and I put that around the uh, UIV plus one rib, and then there's no fusion, obviously, of, the, of that level, uh, and then brought that down to the construct and, and dominoed it on. Uh, that turns out to be quite an expensive implant, and it's a bit more uh, surgery uh, than I'm kind of willing to, to uh, be patient enough to perform now. I have gone to a tether between the upper instrumented vertebra spinous process and the spinous process of the UIV plus one, and I've been very happy. Uh, with that approach. Again, that's another uh, complication that we need to be cognizant of the proximal junctional failure. In this lady, we revised the lower end of the construct with a, uh, a, an oblique uh, interbody fusion at 4.5, you can see, and then uh, instead of revising the instrumentation, really just patched it with a couple of offset uh, connectors. I think I would use more robust instrumentation now, uh, but in this lady's uh, situation without much deformity that had to be addressed, uh, we were able to get a solid uh, interbody fusion there at 4.5. And uh, this is this is the woman I was thinking of uh, in the previous slide. So this, is, again, is a woman I took care of about five years ago and is one of the reasons I've gone from three to five, four rods now is my primary construct. Uh, we got a nice correction on her uh, and a delayed ALF at 5.1, T-lifts at 3.4 and 4.5, uh, and then just a three-rod construct at that time uh, across the, uh, the lower lumbar spine and lumbosacral junction. Uh, but she came back, she had to delay her revision due to COVID in part, uh, and uh, she's an example of what I was talking about. She came back with unilateral rod fracture uh, and what appears to be a pseudarthrosis, clearly at, at uh, at uh, 3-4, uh, but an intact rod initially on the opposite side, and she, at that point she was clinically relatively asymptomatic. Uh, but eventually the uh, other rod, contralateral rod failed and you can see she recurred some of her deformity and by this point was really quite painful. Uh, and so we uh, took her back for a revision. This was done in the primary operation. You can see a little bit prominent here, but mechanically and biologically uh, sound construct and, and she healed 5-1 nicely. Uh, and here's uh, our post-operative imaging then following her revision. Uh, at one stage, we did uh, an OLIF here at 3-4 uh, from the left side and then turned her over and re revised her uh, construct with a fairly typical four-rod construct, uh, similar to what I do in a primary operation now. And I've seen her now at one year uh, out from this, and she appears solidly healed and very happy with her result. 
Uh, and finally, this gentleman is another legacy patient of mine uh, that uh, we did initially a T10 to pelvis for. Uh, he uh, healed that, but then developed a um, proximal junctional failure that we revised with a, a, a PSO of T11, actually. And I don't, I'm not, and you know, I'm not, that's not bad correction, uh, but I don't uh, like the lateral view there entirely. Uh, and I think the bigger issue here is I would have done, I would today do a much more robust connection between the new instrumentation and the prior instrumentation. I do not rely on a sole domino at this point. I would have brought the instrumentation several levels further down and probably used three dominoes on either side. Uh, and we took him back and revised that. I may have this slightly out of order. Let me see here. This, let me see, no, that's what, this is right. So he, he came back with a uh, rod fracture there at the T11 junction, you can T11, T12 junction. Uh, you can see here the dominoes uh, have failed or the rod has broken just below the domino. And um, uh, you can see he's got a clear pseudarthrosis there anteriorly. So uh, we revised this with um, a, um, uh, a combined, this was a two-stage posterior and then an anterior thoracotomy uh, and vertebrectomy. So in conclusion, rod fracture remains a significant concern. I think implant strategies are changing and um, I think a lot of us have gone to uh, multiple rod constructs, uh, larger diameters, stiffer materials uh, and um, modularity with dual head screws and offset and uh, inline connectors I think is critical and using multiple connectors as I've shown uh, has been my approach increasing the uh, the interconnection of the devices. I think as we identified it helps not just with flexion extension but with rotation which is probably one of the main methods of uh, rod fatigue. And stay tuned, now new alloys may offer sufficient strength to allow uh, a reversal of this trend and maybe a reduced rod number and rod size. And uh, thank you, this is a slide I show in a lot of uh, talks. Um, this is my son in 2011 uh, at uh, the game six between the Cardinals and the, uh, the uh, Texas Rangers in the World Series. Uh, and uh, he was standing, we were about five rows behind uh, the Cardinals dugout and uh, Albert Pujols was walking off the mound or off the diamond with the third, third out in his glove and my son was standing on his seat waving his uh, little league glove and Albert flipped the ball to him and a guy right in front of us uh, didn't see my son reached up and grabbed it out of the air and Albert stopped on the first step of the dugout and shook his head and pointed at my son and the, the gentleman turned around and said, oh, I guess this is yours, and gave it to my son. It was, uh, it was like something out of a movie. It was like slow motion. So we, we were just back there this last weekend uh, watching, them, uh, watching them against their nemesis, the Cubs, uh, with uh, Albert back on the team and uh, a lot of fun. So that's all I got. Great, great <laughs> stuff. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> So one quick question, can you go back to the stiffness slide? So the idea of titanium was to be very similar to bone, to kind of mimic bone and have that modulus of elasticity as close to bone as possible. So that famous give stiffness, um, I think maybe one slide before that. Uh, so this green, if you actually uh, plotted bone out, mm -hmm. bone would be way below that and have a longer run out kind of. Right. Uh, so. But the closest biomaterial was titanium. Now, how does more stiffness function with that? Obviously, we have problems with titanium, but that's mainly the notch sensitivity, as you identified, this cracking of the surface when we bend them. So tell us about stiffness of rods and how desirable that is to have an actually solid, remodeled bone underneath that. You know, it's a great question. I, the, um, you know, I, I would kind of, I think a counterpoint uh, in terms of fusion is, uh, is, is peak, right? So peak is also, the modulus of peak is very close to trabecular bone. Uh, titanium is probably closer to cortical bone. Um, but, you know, I think if you look at the track record for peak as a fusion implant, uh, it's not great. Uh, so um, 
I, it's it's an unanswered question. I, I think it is a, a very good question. Uh, I think there is some possibility that with a stiffer construct, you're going to end up with a you know a weaker fusion mass. It's possible, uh, and I think you might end up with a higher incidence of junctional uh, issues with a stiffer construct. Uh, so it may not be, you know a stiffer may not always be better for sure. Uh, but um, you know I, I think a 10% rod fracture rate uh, it's it's just a hard Heartbreaking complication, and and it always it seems to happen. You know, as, as that one slide I showed you, a, a year or more out. So it's these patients have gone through this uh, extensive surgery. They're kind of on the other end of the recovery, and then suddenly there's a failure that, in some a lot of cases, requires revision. It really is uh, heartbreaking for the patients and for the surgeon. I think this is a great slide, and again, we'll, we don't know the answer, as you yeah, said. Yeah. We don't know what the ideal uh, uh, kind of a combination of stiffness versus bone remodeling and load absorption of bone is. Quickly, and then we'll have to end, unfortunately, but this is a great talk. Thanks for doing that. And I always learn more from every time I hear this. Um, when we see a patient with a long construct in clinic and there's a rod fracture, what should we do diagnostically? What's the uh, preferred workup in your opinion? I, I usually get a CT scan, right? And uh, that's much more sensitive at identifying a uh, uh, non-union. I think I showed that one example of a woman that had only unilateral rod fracture, but a clear non-union. Uh, but at that point, you know, clinically doing well enough. And, and I think we gave her an electrical stimulator, which may be, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, maybe somewhat ineffectual and weak, but uh, it's sort of, uh, there's not a lot else to offer, and, and uh, but nothing to do do really surgically uh, unless they become more symptomatic. So if a patient on CT scan has a reassuringly solid bone mass underneath, can we just wait and see? I would definitely, if they're clinically, if they're clinically doing well, uh, it certainly can inform decision making, right? Yeah. Uh, I have to ask a supplemental question. So this is um, one of those things we have been very successful in getting people with these long fusions, and there's some really fantastic cases you showed there, thanks. We, we encourage them to go back to normal lives within some, uh, some uh, restrictions, but very few actually, and it's been pretty impressive what patients with these long fusions can do. There was a question on YouTube, by the way. Um, should we not do that? Should we not have them bungee jump and go <laughs> off-roading, which are concrete examples of some of my patients with long fusions? Yeah, I, you know, it depends on the patient's age, right, and their desires. Uh, you know, that's something that LSDI has uh, provided data on as well. So. Uh, these patients are limited by stiffness after long fusions. Uh, it turns out that the change in their perception from their own baseline is not that big. But if you compare them to patients who don't have these long fusions, they clearly are functional limitations. Uh, and, and I encourage patients, you know, I, I also I think it's an important piece of communication to tell patients you're, you're gonna want to try to stretch this out. You're gonna want to try to do exercises to regain mobility. That is not what you wanna be doing. Uh, and, and first of all, it's gonna be ineffective. Second of all, if it's effective, it's gonna be detrimental. So, uh, I, you know, certainly the examples you cite, I would be hesitant to encourage a patient to go back to bungee jumping. I mean, certainly I get asked about golf uh, a lot, things like that. Even golf, right, is it's a little hard on your low back or it uses your low back, I'd say, as a whip. Um, uh, so it does use spinal mobility. But uh, I wouldn't tell a patient they couldn't golf, but I'd tell them their game is going to be affected and they may want to focus on, on their short game. <laughs> so we have to come to a close. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Thank you to our fellows. And thank you to the many viewers across the world. Just a quick shout out to Jeff Kaplan, Jeff Shimandel, uh, Maximo Teles Gitz, um, Robert Huang, many, many others. Thank you so much for joining us and hope uh, we can all work together towards a better future in spine surgery.